Well, everyone, as we are, as we're kind of settling in here, get yourselves ready. You can open your Bibles if you have them with you to Daniel 2, but I'll be, of course, reading Scripture for us as well. But before we look at God's Holy Scripture together today and enjoy God's Word, please, again, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I am quite aware of my unworthiness. None of us are worthy. You use broken and busted things because that's all you have to work with. And I thank you that you pour out your grace so abundantly, that you pour out your mercy so abundantly, that you would even use someone like me to to read and, and interpret your word. I pray that you would help me to be a blessing to those who uh, hear the sermon today. We pray that your word would find ears that have been opened and hearts that have been made ready that you would do as you say in James 1 5 that you would give wisdom to all who ask for it in your word that we would gain understanding of your word and that we'd be grown closer to you that you would encourage us and correct us and help us through your word because that's how you speak to us you spoke to us uh, by your word so when we want to hear from you that's where we go and we thank you for that we ask that you to bless our time together in your word today in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We have started our new series last week in Daniel, and we finished Daniel 1, and now we move on to Daniel 2. And uh, as a brief reminder, we do every other week, we have evening services as well. This is one of those weekends that we have an evening service, and our evening service tonight is at 6 o'clock as always, and the topic is on hell and heaven as we continue our look at hell. And the reason we do that is so that we understand that you know you must be saved. You've heard that before, but saved from what? And so it is very useful to know saved from what? Well, that would be the eternity of hell. And so we go into detail about that so we understand what we're being saved from that makes us able to have a sense of urgency in sharing the gospel with others. And it also helps us to have a greater appreciation and a greater grateful spirit to the Lord for what he has saved us from. So that's what's happening tonight and uh, look forward to seeing whoever can make it at six o'clock. Today, though, we're talking about Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And this is a troubling dream. It starts out in verse one saying, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and sleep left him. And so his sleep is so troubled, there's something disturbing about this dream that it's causing him to not be able to sleep well. And it's significant enough that it's disturbing his nighttime routines. And if anybody has had trouble sleeping for any amount of time, you know that, it, especially if you're stressed or if you're full of anxiety, and that's the point here, that's what's happening to him. He's having these dreams that are causing him great distress, great anxiety, and so he's unable to sleep. Verse 2. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show to me the dream and its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. And the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain or buy time, because you see that the word from me is firm. What's the word from him? Death, if you cannot tell me what this dream is and its interpretation. Not just what the dream means, what the dream was as well. If you do not make the dream known to me, but there is one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupted words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. Makes sense? 
King knows that, look, if you can tell me what the dream is without me even telling you the dream, well, then certainly you'd be able to tell me the interpretation too because that's a lesser thing to do. He's saying, tell me what it is I dreamed. Tell me the dream. He's not, he's not saying, give me the accurate interpretation or anything. He wants to know if they can accurately tell him what he dreamed. He's saying to these people who are supposedly all wise soothsayers, sorcerers, Chaldeans, and wise men, you guys are so smart. You're the wisest men in the kingdom, and you keep reminding me of that. Now is your time to put up or shut up. Tell me what my dream is. These men were living on the king's coattails, so to speak, right? All the time they're living on their supposed ability to contact these fake gods and learn from them the truths of the hidden arts and, and secrets of great renown. So the king is calling them out. They've presented themselves in this way, right? For No doubt for a long time they've been in the courts of kings telling them, well, just ask us and we shall consult the bones, we shall consult the gods, we shall find out for you the secret things and give you wisdom, O king. And that's how they earn their bread. That's how they get paid, is to do those things. That's how they make their living on this supposed ability to contact the gods and hear back from them and advise the king. And if they truly are what they claim to be, Nebuchadnezzar says, well, if you are what you say you are, you can do this for me. Contact your gods and have them tell you what my dream was. And of course, they go, gulp, right? Uh Uh-oh. They can't do that. beyond their ability. They know that the king has spoken firmly, that if you can't do this, you will be torn in pieces. This is a harsh threat by Nebuchadnezzar, and it's a method of execution that is consistent with its times and with its location. Dismemberment like this, being cut apart or torn apart, sometimes they would even tie people to trees and have those trees with a rope at each limb. And use that to have bent inwards and use that to have the tree cut and then the body snapped. Gruesome, horrible ways of punishment. So these men have all these previous encounters with the harshness of kings and they don't want to have happen to them what they've seen happen to others. Daniel's understanding of this is clear from the text when, when he is putting it forth this way. God is using Daniel to tell us this story. And he wants it to make it clear that that these magicians, these sorcerers, these Chaldeans, they knew that this was an all or nothing thing. They knew that they were being asked to do something that they said they could do, but deep down in their hearts, they knew they couldn't do it. They had been lying all along, faking it. The command is firm. The king is not going to give them any clues, no hints as to what his dream was. He remembered it. He just wants to see if they can interpret it, if they can tell him what the dream is and interpret the dream. This is quite a shrewd move. Let the the king tell us, they keep saying, like they ask him twice. But but, uh, just let the king tell us, and certainly we can give him the interpretation. This is is a great example of human failure. (laughs) This is worldly men with worldly human skills who had tried to build up themselves to the king and say, we can do all these amazing things. And when the king finally comes to him and says, great, I need you to do an amazing thing, they have to admit that they can't do it. That human skill and human, human uh, ability has failed. No human can do what the king is asking and they, we used to tell the king, we have access to the gods, we have access to spirits, that's how we can tell you things that, and do things that humans can't do. And when the king calls them out on it, they can't meet the bill. They can't do it. What we're going to see is someone who can do it, and that is Daniel. But the only reason Daniel can do what these men cannot is because Daniel trusted the Lord and went to the Lord in prayer. It wasn't because Daniel was greater than all these magicians and sorcerers or that he had something that they didn't. Well, actually, he did. He had faith in a God that they did not know. And it's God who tells the dream, and it's God who gives its interpretation to Daniel. And Daniel is just his mouthpiece. 
Because of this, God gets the glory. And I'll tell you that that is always the case throughout all of Scripture. It is God who deserves and gets all the glory, always and forever. That's why in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says that no one can boast because it's all a free gift of God and His grace. So that no one can boast. Even in our salvation, we have nothing we can boast about except our Lord who saved us and His grace, unmerited favor that was given to us, and His mercy that we did not deserve. And even the faith that we have is given to us by Him according to the same text. He gets all the glory. Daniel 2, verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. This is unreasonable, king. No one can do this, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. No one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not among the flesh with us. Ah, they've admitted it. They've come clean in a sense. No one can do what you ask but a God. And there are no gods here living among us. Therefore, no one can do what you ask, O king. They're admitting that true revelation comes not from man, but from God. They don't realize just how true of a thing that they're saying. It's not an achievement of man. It's something that only God can do. Despite all their wisdom, real and imagined, despite all this, they have no answer for the king because only God can do what he's asking. This is kind of true of salvation too, right? How do you get made peace with God? A lot of people write books and talk about how the answer is within. Contemplate your navel long enough, look within, and you will find your peace, you will find your purpose, you will find your destiny, all these different things. No, 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 none of that is true. All that's within us is is sin, wretchedness, need, fault, right? And the answer is without us. It's in Christ. It's in God. It's in his word. It's not in us. It's outside of us. So if you're totally corrupted and you know that your nature is corrupted, then you're not going to go looking into your corrupted nature to find the answer to that corruption. You need to go outside of that corrupted nature, which is God, which is Christ. God made the way. Who is Jesus Christ? John 14, 6. The way, the truth, the life. Exclusive. They're like some modern ministers today who spend their time studying psychiatry and psychology and political science and philosophy. They have all this human wisdom. All the, they could write books that would fill a self-help section in Barnes & Noble. But that is not where we go for our answers. That's worldly answers. I want something that helps me get out of this world and get to heaven. I need to go to the source. I need to go to somebody who's been there. I need to, there's only one who's been there and come back, Jesus. I need to go to him. That's where the answer is. And Jesus is God. So just like how these supposed wise men are saying, King, you're asking too much of us. We can't possibly do it. The only person who could do this is God. I could say that about people who try and tell you that there's ways to get to heaven outside of Jesus Christ. That's false. There is only one way. No man can do it. Only a God can do it. And that God is Jesus. So the strategy of the wise men has to be at this point to convince the king that he's being unreasonable. They can't do what he's requesting, so now I've got to try and convince the king to change his mind. Look, it's not a good idea to tear me apart from limb to limb. Instead, recognize that you're being unreasonable. I don't want you to accuse me of being incompetent. I don't want you to accuse me of being a liar about all the things I've promised I can do, but I want you to convince yourself that you're being unreasonable, which will save our skin. Verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry. He's no dummy. He's understanding what they're doing. You're buying time. You can't do what I'm asking you to do you're buying time. So because of that, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. They were part of this group. They weren't the same type of men, but they were under that same umbrella. So they're being sought out too. 
The king is no dummy. He knows that, that false religion is useless. So you guys are telling me all this stuff about all these gods and all these spirits that you talk to, but you can't talk to them when you need them the most to save your own skin. This is hogwash. You're all sent to death. He's no dummy. He didn't want to deal with them anymore. He gives the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. You must remember, too, that Nebuchadnezzar was a relatively new king at this time. And so this is a, a way for him to also show his power and show that he is wise himself and that he is in control and he won't be led around by the nose by those who are supposed to be his advisors. So he decides he's going to clean house. But then something happens. Verse 14. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men in Babylon. This is the man who's charged with going and taking the king's decree and putting it into action. Daniel says to Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the matter known to Daniel. He tells Daniel what's going on. Gives him the lowdown, fills him in. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Daniel is obviously innocent in all of this, yet we see him calmly and kind of discreetly dealing with this crisis. Hey, what's the problem? Why is this so urgent? What's going on? The captain of the king's guard tells him what's going on, and he says, tell the king to get me an appointed time, and I will talk to him about his dream and its interpretation. In such a frantic time, the fact that Daniel is calm really reveals something about the man. And this isn't to build up Daniel so much as to build up what God does in a man who puts his faith and trust in him, who does not yield to the culture around them. Don't forget, like we talked about last week, Daniel and his friends had all been captured and brought to Babylon and tried to be tempted to give up their religion, to give up their faith in God with great food, with new clothes, to live in the palace. Now we see the type of evidences that you see in a godly man who does not give up his faith in God. He's calm, under fire, wise. He asks the king to give him time. This was not a stalling tactic like the wise men. Daniel just knew that hey, the only one who can answer this is the Lord, and I just need time to go to him in prayer and ask for him to answer my prayer. That's the time that Daniel's seeking for. The wise men and all these sorcerers were seeking for time just to, just to spare their lives. Daniel's speak, seeking time so that God might answer his prayer and act. Verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. This is what we do, believers. You're presented with a problem. You know you need to go to God. What else did Daniel do? He didn't just drop on the floor right there. He went to his fellow believers. He tells them the matter, makes it known to them. Then he goes on in verse 18 and tells them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Go and pray with me that God might have mercy on us and give us the dream and its interpretation so that we might be saved. That's what we do, believers. It's good to pray on your own, but you go to the rest of the fellowship and you ask them to pray with you as well. And not just in these kind of monumental moments, in every moment. In all times, be praying unceasingly. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It's not talking about walking around chanting a mantra every second of every day. It's talking about in all situations, be a people of prayer. Let it be like breathing to you. It comes so naturally. And you do it all the time so much that you don't even think about it. Then Daniel went to his house, made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men. This is, all, this is a situation only God can meet this need. So best to go there. Don't waste time going anywhere else. You go there. They didn't sit down and say, how can we get out of this? What can we do? Let's, let's try and think of some great scheme that we can... Nope. Only God can solve this. I go to him. 
Daniel prayed with his friend. Daniel had confidence that if they prayed to God, that God would do this. Joseph had had his dreams, uh, dreams interpreted with God's help. Certainly this was something God could do. And there certainly was a lot at stake. Verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. God answered their prayer. And then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. God revealed it to him. Daniel didn't sit down and he wasn't, uh, you ever seen that picture online or that meme where it's got the, the guy and it's looking all kind of crazy and he's pointing at this board and it's got red string going to 50 different pictures everywhere, right? And he's looking crazy as he's trying to, that's, he's trying to, he wasn't trying, Daniel wasn't trying to discover the meaning of the vision like that. He was waiting for God to reveal it to him. And God did. God does that. That's how God operates. He reveals himself. And God did that here with Daniel in this vision. You seek God's help. You ask for his revelation. And it was all in the right motive, too. It wasn't a selfish motive. Maybe in a dream or in some kind of a vision that happens at night, God answers his prayer. And this sums up. This praise that Daniel gives God after God answers his prayer sums up this whole entire book of Daniel, that God is the one who controls all things. God is the one who sets up rulers and takes them down. God is the one who sets up nations and takes them down. God is the one who grants all wisdom. God is the one who grants all strength. God is the one who grants all insight. God is the one who gives all revelation. That's, that's the theme of the book of Daniel, that God is supreme. He is sovereign. He is almighty and all-powerful, and there is none like him. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, that you have made known to us the king's matters. What a praise. When God answers your prayer, do you take time to praise him? Do you take time to praise him? Thank him? Acknowledge him? Make sure you do. Daniel praises God for his power and might recognizes how God is in control of all things, that God is mightier than anyone. Daniel praises God that he had communicated to him. Thank you, God, for giving me the answer. Thank you for giving me clarity. Uh, how about when you're reading the scripture and all of a sudden, maybe you're reading a commentary and you read a description of a verse and you go, I get it now. And that revelation came from God. When that happens, like, oh, thanks, God. That's a great, I, how did I miss that before? Thank you. Praise him for that. God reveals knowledge. Daniel had faith in God, that God could give him the answer. Faith is often indicated by how we praise God, or if you even praise God, when he does answer your prayers. Verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went into Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, captain of the guard. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. And the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. So get this picture, okay? The king says, So, Daniel, uh, Belshazzar, you can show me the interpretation of this dream and the dream itself? And he goes, No. <laughs> I mean, for just that split second, right? Why? What? But then Daniel quickly says, how, who can really interpret it? And Daniel's right. No, I can't. It's God who will do it. Listen to what he says. 
Daniel answered the king, says, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lie in bed are these. So Daniel says, nope, I can't do that, but God in heaven can. There's one true living God in heaven, and he's the one who can do it, and he has given you a vision of what will happen in the latter days. Here it is, verse 29. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this, future thoughts. And he who reveals mysteries, that's God, made known to you what is to be. God gave you a dream about the future. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living. Humility. Do you hear that humility? Daniel could have used this moment and been like, hey, king, ain't nobody like me, king. You ain't never had a friend like me. I can tell you things that other people can't. He didn't take that opportunity to do that. In humility, he gives all the glory to God. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have more than any other who are living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Daniel just keeps pointing every time to God, giving him the glory. It's also interesting, here's Daniel being very humble, right? And the captain of the guard, Ariok, comes in and goes, King, 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 hey, I found a guy who can answer your question. Hey, me, me, don't forget me. I'm the one who found this guy and he's the one who's able, right? Big contrast there. Daniel doesn't take any credit. He just gives all credit and glory to God. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck this image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken into pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away. They are destroyed so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone, the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel just gave a description to the king of a dream that the king had and told nobody of. Only God can give that information. Daniel's interpretation is clear. This is a massive, spectacular image made of different materials gold silver bronze iron clay and as you go down from top to bottom they devalue right you'd rather have a pocket full of gold than a pocket full of clay so as you go down from top to bottom it gets lower and lower in value these things were broken into pieces destroyed by a stone that was made without human hands that's important and we'll get to that Verse 36, this was the dream, Daniel says to the king, and now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom. Did you catch that? Who gives kingdoms? God. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom God of heaven has given this kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You, O king, are the head of gold. This is one of those great times in Scripture where Scripture interprets itself for us. So King Nebuchadnezzar is that head of gold on that terrifyingly large statue. Another kingdom. Well, into whose hands is given to dwell? Yep, I did read that. Uh, You are the head of gold. According to this, another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. 
And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so that kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw, the iron mixes with soft clay, so they mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. There's that mountain that was talked about at the very end. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Remember the the rock that's cut out with no human hands? Here's where it's being talked about. Just as you saw that stone that was cut out from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke into pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and his interpretation is sure. Boy, I would have liked to have been in that room after that. Just could have probably heard a pin drop. Daniel reported the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream first. And this is wise. It gives him credibility. He didn't just start trying to throw out interpretations. He gave himself credibility and the God who gave him the answer credibility by saying, here's the dream. I'm going to answer the toughest part first. Here's what nobody else could tell you, but God knew. He says, you are the head of gold. You're clearly the head of gold. After you will come three other kingdoms, each represented by a different material. You'll see different kingdoms that come after yours and a final kingdom that's set up by the God who gave me the interpretation of this dream. The three empires that came after Babylon were Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The nature of these empires is accurately reflected by the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. Again, gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay... De- degrading in greatness as it goes down. Same with this kingdoms. They got lesser and lesser in their greatness as it goes down. Nebuchadnezzar was a monarch. He was an absolute monarch. Held great authority, great wealth and power. The succeeding empires that came after him would be progressively less so. They might be larger or last longer than Babylon, but none of them had the same amount of centralized power and wealth that Nebuchadnezzar did. That's why he's represented of the head of gold. In verse 39, it says, Another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze. So gold, silver, bronze. Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. They shall be inferior and rise after you, yet a third kingdom of bronze shall rule over all the earth. Inferior means lower. So lower as far as stature goes. Medo-Persia didn't have the glory of Babylon. It's silver compared to gold of Babylon. But it was not inferior to strength in Babylon. It actually conquered Babylon in much later. So it wasn't that it was a weak empire. It just wasn't as centralized, and it wasn't as rich, and it wasn't as all all powerful as Babylon was at its time. Also, in the case of Greece, bronze is less valuable than silver, as silver is less valuable than gold, but bronze is stronger. I'd much rather have a sword of bronze than a sword of gold. My sword of gold wouldn't last me very long on the battlefield. So bronze is strong. When it says that it will rule over all the earth, you remember maybe from your history books that Alexander the Great became the ruler of the known world. The third kingdom of bronze is the one that shall rule over the earth. Verse 40 says, Then there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things, and like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. That was the Roman Empire. The Babylonian Empire stood for 66 years. Medo Persia for 208. Greece for 185. Rome for more than 500 years. It's fitting to represent Rome with iron because it is strong. Their legions were known as iron legions, known for their strength, known for their crushing strength. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, 
but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. This is a kingdom that comes after the kingdom of Rome. And as you saw iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but it will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. This is the revived Roman Empire, kind of the end times version of the Roman Empire. Partly brittle, partly strong. Ruling in the final time of the Gentile empires before Christ comes and destroys it and sets up His forever kingdom. The fact that this iron is mixed with clay shows that it's not as strong as it seems. It seems invincible. Oh, it's going to be invincible. But it's iron mixed with clay. It won't stand the test of time. It will be brittle and it will shatter especially when Christ comes. And in the days of those kings, this is verse 44, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to other people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And this kingdom shall stand forever. There's only one kingdom that stands forever, folks, and that's the kingdom of Christ. God's kingdom is the only kingdom that will stand forever and ever and ever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is short, certain, and the interpretation sure. So this, all these worldly systems and empires, from Babylon all the way down to the Antichrist system of new revived Rome, all the way from Babylon, to Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and the new Antichrist revived Rome, it will all be destroyed to make way for the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. And it will be Jesus Christ who destroys it. He will destroy the worldly system as we know it. He will destroy all the empires and set up his own forever and ever. This is the final rule. It will never be replaced. It will be eternal. That stone that's mentioned that's cut out of the mountain with no human hands, that means no human had anything to do with it. No human can stand up and say, hey, God, remember that time when I helped you cut that stone out of the mountain? Hey, you remember that time when I helped you save me? Hey, you remember that time when I helped... No, no. No human is ever going to be able to stand in the presence of God and take credit for something that God does alone by himself. And this is something that God does by himself. The stone is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The mountain is the picture of God's transcendent power and government. And Christ is coming out of that and crushes this large statue, obliterates it like chaff, blows it away. Nothing left. This is at Jesus' second coming. In the end, at this time, at the end of that, when you get to the bottom of the statue, and the toes and the, and the feet, this is going to be when God will come and set up His kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. This is a future prophecy. The stone cut without hands shatter, shatters this confederation of kings, shatters the empires of man that man has built. Since the fall of the Roman Empire, there's never been a singular world-dominating empire that we would put on the same level as equal to Rome. Completely, tyrannically controlling the largest mo known sections of the world. There hasn't been anything like that since Rome. Many have tried, but none have succeeded. You can see some that are close, but none have actually succeeded. All of them had power, all of them had influence, but nothing compared to what we saw in the Roman Empire or saw in Babylon or Medo-Persia. But this is what tells us that this hasn't happened yet. That's still in the future. We have yet to see that part. And that also means that in the future we still have yet to see that stone crush that statue, broken into pieces. A single divisive event. This is the second coming of Christ. A single event. Uh, that's what's described. It's not saying like, oh, and a series of stones will cut, be cut out of the mountain and will come down. No. One big stone cut out from the mountain without human hands. One big event. Boom. Deals with it all. And that event is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That event is still in the future. 
This is a smashing. This isn't the salvation. This is the smashing. This is destruction, purification. And it's Jesus. It's Jesus coming back. And that's what he will do. He will set up his kingdom. He will destroy all other kingdoms and set up his forever kingdom. The final empire, when when Jesus comes back, the final empire that, that will be here will be one that is partly strong and partly fragile. Iron mixed with clay. It has the substance of strength. It might kind of look like strength, but it doesn't really have the strength that you think it has or that they think it has. As a whole... The, the, the whole foundation is weak. If you think of human empires, you think of human government, you think of human society, and you think, oh, look at how far we've come. Oh, look at how smart we've gotten. Oh, look at how technology, you know, we're so advanced, all these other things, right? And you think of this statue as a representation of all these different empires, of man-made empires from head to toe. But Something is only as strong as its foundation. And what is the foundation of this statue that represents mankind's empires? Clay and iron. Weak. Weak. Try to marry together. Doesn't really work. So easily toppled. Easily toppled. And that's exactly what happens when Jesus, who is the stone, comes and crushes it. It, He easily topples it. That's the whole point that's being here. Mankind's empires, man-made empires, weak, fragile. God's empire, powerful. God can crush any man-made thing with ease. No problem. Piece of cake. What's next? Humans' power and humans' empires are nothing compared to God. And His forever power, His incalculable strength, He's almighty. He's all sovereign. Everything is under his command and control, even the smallest molecule. That little molecule that came by, that was under God's sovereign control. The fact that you just took a breath right now is by God's sovereign grace and mercy that he gives you that breath. And that breath too. Oh, and that one too. Stop holding your breath. That one too. This is not a statue that evolved. Mankind loves to think that we evolve and we get better and better and better. What does the statue tell you? Starts out gold, uh, then silver, uh, then bronze, uh, then iron. So what does mankind's civilization and empires and man-made efforts do? It devolves. It doesn't evolve. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Less valuable, less valuable, less valuable. Nebuchadnezzar saw these empires as an impressive image. Daniel sees them later as beasts, which we'll see in another book of Daniel. Daniel wasn't guessing here. He says, this is dream is certain and its interpretation sure. I am telling you that this is exactly what it is. And I can say that because God has said it. God only can predict the future because God is the one who controls it. Kind of makes sense. You want to know what the future is? Well, there's only one person who knows. That's God. Because he's the only one who controls it. That's our sovereign God. Five empires in succession rule over the world. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and later the revived Rome under the Antichrist. These are all devolving. Verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face. Must have really, really moved him. This is the king in control of everything around that he sees and surveys. Falls on his face, pays homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. And the king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men in Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king. He appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Daniel's three friends that he went to and said, pray with me. There's trouble. We need God's mercy and we need God's wisdom. He needs to help us. Please pray with me about it. Those are these men. The same one that we'll read later who go into the fiery furnace those men. Nebuchadnezzar falls on his face, obviously impressed. 
It's not normal for a king to genuflect and show respect like this to another person, especially someone who is a foreign slave of a foreign god. This confirms that Daniel nailed it. And how did Daniel nail it? He nailed it because God nailed it. All Daniel had to do was repeat what God told him. That's it. Just repeat what God told him. Sometimes when you're giving the gospel, you go too much, okay? Sometimes just, just tell him what God told you in the gospel. Just tell him what God's word says. You don't have to have silver tongues. You don't have to know how to say this and that in Greek and Hebrew to be able to share with somebody the gospel. Just tell them what God's word says. That's what Daniel did in interpreting the dream. I just said what God told me to say and everything worked out just fine. Nebuchadnezzar says, your God is the God of gods. Yes. He knew that Daniel himself wasn't the one who revealed these things, but Daniel's God. He knew that because that's what Daniel told him. The king is no dummy. People are kissing up to him all the time. So here's a man with the opportunity of opportunities to to have the king bless him. Daniel could have stood there and said, King, O king, I'm going to tell you everything that you want to know. It's all by my wisdom. It's all by my strength. I'm the smartest guy you've ever seen. Da, 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 da. You make sure that when I'm done giving you the proper interpretation of this dream and the, and the dream itself, that you recognize how awesome I am, okay? Daniel didn't do that. Daniel gave God all the credit and all the glory. And I'm sure that that stood out to the king because who does that? Nobody does that. The captain of the guard was like, hey, hey, king, king, hey, I'm the one who found this guy who says he can interpret your dream. Don't you forget that when he hopefully does it. <laughs> That's what the king's used to. Here Daniel gives God all the credit. So Nebuchadnezzar recognizes it's not Daniel himself, it's God. Daniel's God. And so he gets the glory. And Daniel, God gets the glory. And Daniel gets blessed too. He gets promoted. His life is spared, as are all the other quote-unquote wise men, promoted to high office, and he makes sure that his friends are promoted with him. It's fitting that Daniel's friends got to share in his advancement because they shared in the answer of God's to their prayer. They helped Daniel pray. So just like Daniel benefited from his faith in God, well, they benefit too. They put faith in God and prayed with Daniel. What a great God we serve. Please pray with me as we close. Father, thank you for your word today. As we study through the book of Daniel, we learn what it's like to be faithful when we're surrounded in a world that is not of you. Daniel was surrounded by the Babylonians, their false gods, all these different trials and tribulations that were set upon him, and yet he stayed faithful to you the entire time. And Lord, you showed your power through him. And like Daniel, we ask that you would help us to not yield to the culture around us, Lord, but that you would help us stand firm on your word through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit and through the, through the grace and mercy and faith in Jesus Christ and in your, that in your word, that you would help us to stand firm and not yield to this culture, but instead be a light in this culture. And that you would help us to, to give you all the glory like Daniel did and help us to, to be a blessing to those that you put around us. In Jesus' name, amen.